we are at the Design Summit as part of the New York Design Awards, and I'm thrilled to meet Tom Hennis. Hello, how are you? Hi, great to meet you. Um, you're from the National Memorial. Tell me a bit about this, and, and start with the title, of course. The uh, National September 11 Memorial Museum. I'm the uh, lead exhibition designer. And what exactly, can you take me back a bit to the origins of this memorial museum? Obviously it's a memorial that's incredibly important, but here today we're talking about courage and design courage. So I'd, I'd sort of give a bit of a background to the memorial museum. You'll find that anybody associated with a museum has a little trouble referring to courage and respect to themselves. I think uh, at the same time, there's a case to be made for approaching a project like this fearlessly. Uh, the National September 11 Memorial Museum is underneath the memorial pools at the site of the World Trade Center. And it's built uh, around and on the foundations of the original towers. We started working with the project in 2007 and it opened in 2013. Okay. And, and when the idea, of course, to, to start the memorial, to open the museum, what sort of de design ideas did you have in place, knowing what you needed to have in order to tell that story, not only for the residents of New York, but also for those who are visiting? There were some givens to the site that are archaeological, the, the basic footprints of the building. There were 80,000 square feet of artifacts that were pulled aside by the Port Authority from the wreckage and stored in Hangar 17 at uh, Kennedy Airport. So the physical material of the exhibitions was uh, kind of set in front of us. We knew what the palette was going to be. We hadn't made selections of the materials to be used. More importantly, we knew we were designing for uh, in, a, in a place of extreme trauma, in a place of social trauma, social scale trauma. And the design had to, in some way, both enable people to re-experience aspects of 9-11, re-experience their own experience of 9-11, come back to the memories they already had of the events, but also not re-traumatize them, not incite further trauma from this event. But how do you actually do that? How do you not incite further trauma from what was a very traumatic event, but also manage to tell a story that, that keeps that memory for all of us, a great understanding of what that occurred? The entrance to the museum is down a very, very long sloping path that takes you from just below ground level to 70 feet below ground. Mm -hmm. Along that path, we invite people into their own memories of the event, not through violence, but through reminders, through the voices of people remembering how they experienced the event on the day, through images of people on the street, through an overlook on the site that lets you kind of get your bearings. That's an overlook from the balcony. Recounting the building of the towers, the destruction of the towers, through just a couple of images and one or two artifacts, and then landing at uh, a place between the so-called survivor stair and the wall that separates uh, the museum from the repository of unidentified remains that the medical examiner holds on the site. So this set of juxtapositions of things that people already know in some way that allow them to gently come into their own memories of the event and to land in a place that then gives them choices of where to go. It's a big open space, it's not crowded, it's not got the sounds, it's, it's not recreating the event. Mm -hmm. What it's doing is reminding us of what happened on this site. And then we allow people to go in whatever direction they choose, into a memorial exhibition, into a more intensive historical exhibition, which in itself allows people to uh, regulate their own experience between something that's pretty much a straight recounting of the events of the day around the perimeter of the exhibit to much more difficult material, narrative material that recounts some of the pain of the day, recounts the events at much closer range, but it's something you have to enter into, it's something you have to choose to go into, so people have a lot of control over their experience throughout the museum. So through this process of going to the Memorial Museum from what was a very traumatic event, how do you not re-traumatize the visitors or those from New York? The main thing is to give people control over their own experience and to gently bring people back into their own memories without shocking them, without recreating the event on the site. 
We always want people to know that they're in a museum at the site of the attacks, not in the attacks themselves. So this long ramp that leads people from just below ground level to 70 feet below ground where the bulk of the exhibitry is, begins with the voices of people from around the world remembering where they were when they heard about the attack. It moves on closer and closer to the site of attacks through through the images of people looking and watching the attacks live to an overview of this site of the attack on an overlook from the ramp doubles back and then the big building of the towers through a single object the commemoration plaque through a photograph of the towers there and the towers gone through one piece of steel that signifies the extent of the enormity of what happened and then through missing posters that are projected onto the walls that evoke the memory of the people who lost their lives so we bring people through the entire event and then ultimately down next to the so-called survivor stair which was a stairway for many people the last route to safety on the one side and on the other side there's a huge chamber that has, says no day shall erase you from the memory of time on it that separates the museum from the repository of unidentified remains that the medical examiner keeps on the site. So between this living and dying, this juxtaposition, this strange contradiction of the day uh, brings people into the space of the museum. And then they have control over where they go, whether they go to a memorial exhibition, whether they go into the more intense historical exhibition where even there they have the ability to sort of stay around the perimeter, which is more a timeline telling of the events of the day, or go deeper into the center of the exhibit where much of the difficult material, the narrative material, the voices, the sounds, the, the, the experience of the day is played out. For you as the exhibition designer, working with so many different people, those who experience the day, of course, so those like myself who are visiting or have heard about it from afar, what, what is it for you to design for something like this, to work with so many different types of experiences and, and people to communicate those stories in that exhibition? What's most important is to recognize that there are many legitimate differences in perspective in an event like this, just as there's a spectrum of legitimate perspective on how the world and, and this country, how, how people should behave after this event. And in order to build an exhibit that is true to the event, we have to listen very carefully to the perspectives of a lot of different people. And in listening, it shapes the design. The, the trick is to bring contradictions into juxtaposition because that's the essence of the event and sharpen sometimes those distinctions through the juxtaposition of objects or through the juxtaposition of stories, not to kind of sand it all down and make it, make it easy. We like to say that uh, this should be a safe enough museum, safe enough that people feel comfortable and can identify with something that they find there that's, that's personal to them, but not so safe that it doesn't expose them to other points of view, that it doesn't invite them to think about the events differently, think about the future differently, because this museum is as much about the future as it is about the past. Yeah, which, which leads me to my next thought, which is how does, an, how does a museum like this evolve or look to the future to, to be able to shift in time? There are several ways to make a museum evolve. The most important way in this particular museum is through digital media, uh, some of it that evolves daily. There's a piece that we call the Timescape, which is a 60-foot long graphic representation of time from the moment of the event to today, literally today. And it uses an algorithms to pull out associations with 9-11 from the global media to chart the shifting meanings of 9-11 across time. And it's actually quite extraordinary sometimes to see, to be reminded of what we associated with it in the past and how we feel about it now. So that's a real-time kind of thing, to be able to add narratives as time goes on to be able to shift some of the exhibits to change out parts of the exhibits and to be to have a continuing program of changing exhibits and public programs that respond to what this event 
how this event resonates today and in the future. Um, I mean, there, there are different memorial museums throughout America, and in fact, throughout the world for various events, whether it's World War One or something like that, whether it's a monument, for example. What is it that makes this one quite unique, quite significant, in terms of its design? I think there are a couple of things that make it unique. One of them is that it was built during the period in which the follow-on to this event is playing out. It's still not over. 9-11 is still with us. And so by its nature, it is an evolving museum. Being its, its physical site is also quite unusual because it's on the foundations of these enormous buildings. It's below ground. It's a very unusual sighting of a museum, an association of a museum and a memorial. But I think the other thing that, that's very important about it is that it was designed in broad consultation with many, many different groups that were part of this event, from family members to community members to religious leaders to people in the broader community, politicians as well. It, so it's, it, is a, it is a mix of virtually all of the tensions in society, as well as the potential of society to move on, it really does reflect what's going on in the larger world around it. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you wish you could do today to the museum in terms of design that perhaps you couldn't get through? There are all kinds of things that we always wish we could have done that we couldn't get through. Um, I think even sharper distinctions among perspectives, I think, bringing out uh, more controversial narratives would have made it a better museum. At the same time, I have to say, because of the many constituencies involved, this is probably the best museum it could be in its first generation. It needs to evolve over time, and it needs to find its place in society over time. Yeah, so, so those controversial narratives can have that place in the future once things have settled more, I suppose. I think it's... it's I was going to say it's almost inevitable that they will. I will hope that they will. I think that depends on the trajectory of the museum and its relationship to the society, whether it stays at a point where it can be thought of as a place to work things out, to put theses forward and let them be discussed, or whether the narrative settles into a kind of compacted, compressed space. Uh, 9-11 is about collapse, uh, and, and it's the collapse is not just buildings. It's about the collapse of narrative. It's about the collapse of discourse in society. With us or against us is a collapse narrative. There's no space in there for negotiation. And so much of what we've tried to do in the museum is open up space to be able to walk around among these perspectives and find your own place within it. If that continues, I think the museum will grow and it will become a more vital part of society. Um, Tom Hennis, thank you so much. It's great to speak with you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.